we just thank you for this glorious day. We lift our holy hands up to you. Thank you for anointing the service, anointing the words coming out of my mouth, and anointing our sound system. In Jesus' name, amen. So what I was saying is I don't want to disappoint you with the, my series on Joseph, but I'm going to postpone it for two weeks because Pastor Eloy will be here next week, and I don't want to get it started without being able to continue it because it's going to be a great series, and I've been already just so dialed in and focused. So this morning, we're going to be talking about things about how we live as a Christian. Is that okay? About Christian living. Paul, could you turn me down just a little bit? Thank you. We're going to be talking about Christian living. Right now, we live in a time in this country and in this world where everybody is seeking something. How many of you woke up this morning looking for something? How many of you woke up looking for your car keys? Or maybe some of you looked over to see if your spouse was there and they didn't ever come home. <laughs> or maybe you're looking for, okay, that was a joke. <laughs> or maybe you're looking for the money you had in your wallet that maybe your daughter decided she needed for a shirt or something. But you just woke up looking for something. How many of you woke up this morning just looking for Jesus Christ? How many of you just woke up and said, you know what, Lord, I'm here. It's if all I can do is just be here, I am here. I woke up this morning just thinking, you know, Lord, I've come a long ways. I ain't where I, I, I need to be by far, but praise God, I'm not where I used to be. Amen. And how many of you could say that? How many of you could say that I know I'm not where God has sent me, but I know I'm not where I started? And I think sometimes we get this mindset that when we become Christians, we have to ultimately reach this high level of achievement. Like when you get saved, all of a sudden I'm going to be here. And it's not that way. Pastor Paul used to always teach us that life is lived at in levels and arrived at stages. So you may be in a level, but you're going through stages in each level. Kind of like Jumanji, right? We're on level nine with the double hurricanes out in the Gulf. Can it get any worse? I'm going to say yes, it is. But it's going to be bad. But we live life in levels and arrive at stages. And, and everybody's at a different level and everybody's at a different stage. Some of us are, are really strong in our faith and we're studying the word and we're out pounding the pavement trying to win souls for Jesus Christ. And some of us are just, I hate to use this term, but this just kind of shows you where we're at, just barely saved. Like we just got saved. We don't even know how to spell Bible. We haven't even opened the Bible yet. It still has dust on it, but we're just barely saved. And I say that to say, once you're saved, you're saved. But it was just a point I'm trying to make. We're, we're babes in Christ. We don't know what to do. We don't know how to act. We don't know how to respond when bad things start happening in our lives because we're no longer the same. How many of you have been changed? How many of you are, of you are no longer who you used to be? So when you get saved and you start walking in this Christian life, you, you stop doing the things you used to do. You stop going out to the clubs. You stop going to the bars. You stop staying up late at night looking at things you don't need to be looking at. You stop responding with anger. And you stop responding with, with fighting, perhaps. Or if you're living a life of crime, you stop living crime. So when things come at you, now you've got to respond a different way. And it's not that you have to, but what happens to you? When you get saved, you get filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in. See, we all have, there's a difference between being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and having the Holy Spirit in you. We all have enough measure of Holy Spirit to believe, because it takes faith to believe in Jesus. It takes faith to believe in a man that we've never seen. It takes faith to believe that he died on the cross for our sins. But then there's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And as you start walking and learning and, and learning about Jesus, the Holy Spirit starts speaking to you and says, oh, well that thing you was doing last weekend, Maybe you shouldn't be doing that anymore. And, as you, and it, the title of my sermon this morning is Guidelines for Christian Living. And as you get saved and you start trying to live that holy life, and I always tell people when you first get saved, that is the most critical point of your entire relationship with Christ for your entire life. That and when you've been in the ministry for 30, 40, 50 years. Because two things happen. When you first get saved, the devil is going to come and try to take everything away from you. He wants to keep you deceived. He wants to keep you broken down. He wants to keep you down in your poverty, in your misery, in your hurt, in your anger. And he wants to keep all that stuff in a place so you will not follow him. And when you've been serving God for a long time, what happens? You kind of get complacent. 
So those are the two times that I say is the worst times for being Christians. But one thing that we talked about this morning was the lighthouse. When you get saved and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you have this light in you. And I heard somebody say, oh, you got to let Jesus' light shine. Well, I want to be clear. The Bible specifically says, let your light shine so that your good works can be glorified in heaven. Amen. So how is your light shining this morning? And when we were talking about the lighthouse, God just gave me this amazing visual that they don't put lighthouses together. They space them out. Space them out all over the coast. So when the barges and the big ships are coming in, doesn't matter which direction they're going in the darkness, they're going to what? They're going to run into what? A lighthouse. So as I look out across the stage, uh, the audience out here, I see a bunch of little lighthouses. Is your light shining enough that somebody in the darkness will know to come your way? Or are they going to stay lost? Or the people that's coming to you, now that you're born again Christian, better off, or are they worse off after they meet you? How is your light? How is the light shining? Is it shining bright? Is it shining bright? You should ask yourself every morning, what am I doing today? And one of my favorite phrases that I heard is, if I was put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict me? Is your light shining bright enough that when people see you in the marketplace, they know there's something different about you, not because of what you're saying, but because of the countenance and the spirit and the glow of the Holy Spirit around you? That's how we want to live. And as as lighthouses, as we stand there, lighthouses don't move. Lighthouses are built on a strong foundation, a super strong foundation because of everything that's going to come and hit them. See, the the lighthouses go through the same storm as the people in the storm. The only difference is the, the people in the storm is on a rocky boat. The people in the lighthouse is on a firm foundation. Is that making sense? So are you on a firm foundation this morning or are you in a boat being tossed by every wave of doctrine? We get lost sometimes in doctrine. We get lost sometimes with what other preachers and teachers are trying to teach us. And I said this morning, I I beg you to please, when somebody tells you something, go back and research it. Don't just jump on the bandwagon and believe something because somebody says it. It'll change your life. You'll end up believing a lie. And these are the people that I say are out in the boat. They're lost. They have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. So I encourage you, and I challenge you, everything I say, I want you to question. You ain't gonna hurt my feelings. I promise you. We'll sit down. We'll talk about doctrine. We'll talk about anything you need to talk about. But I want you to be the light, the the lighthouse that is built on the foundation. You ever see the light, the commercials or the TV shows where the, the water just crashes and hits the lighthouse and it just goes right around it? If you're light light and you're built on the foundation, the things that are coming against you are just going to go right around you because your foundation is Jesus Christ. But we have to be strong. We're living right now in a time where everybody is seeker sensitive, where everybody is looking for something that makes them feel good. And you can feel good. You can go anywhere and feel good. But are you getting fed right? What happens, what happens, church, when all the feelings fade away? What happens when all the extras fade away and you're standing there and you realize you've been deceived? You're worse off than what you were. Your your foundation needs to be in Jesus Christ. We need to be at a place where we just quit taking people's opinions and thoughts and just running with it as pure gold. And if you're getting your religion off of Facebook, God help you. Oh, my word. Please stop doing that. Your religion, your politics, your, your marriage counseling, get off of it. Y'all remember that commercial? The, the girl come out and was talking about insurance, and she said, oh, yeah, I saw it on the Internet. And the guy said, oh, well, it's on the Internet. You know, it has to be true, right? Look, everything that you see come across your feed ain't truth. There's a form of godliness but denies the power thereof. I said a few weeks ago that Facebook is the fastest growing religion in the world right now. Everybody goes there to get their worship. Everybody goes there to get their marriage counseling. Everybody goes there to get everything they need, but they're denying who? They're denying God. 
We're not spending time with Christ. We're spending time with our religion. That's why it's important as a lighthouse that you're built on the foundation. If you get the foundation set, and here's what's interesting, the difference, and we're going to talk about the seed in a second. Here's the difference between a foundation and a seed. A foundation, when, you, when the foundation is built, you determine from the beginning how big and how wide and how deep you want the foundation. And once the foundation is built, the only place to build from a foundation is up. So when you build on Jesus Christ, the only place to build, the only place to go as a Christian is straight up. You can't go down. When you look at a seed, you put a seed in the ground, what's the first thing a seed does? It grows down. And there's a whole sermon in that, but the seed has to die so it can grow down and establish the root system because without the root system, the little bud, the little yearling that pushes through the dirt doesn't last. And so often, God will give us, a plant us in a place and the, seed, and the roots will start growing. And we get up and leave from where God planted us, right? Before we even see the sprout. And that's what I mean by seeker sensitive. We go from one place to another place to another place and we're looking for things. We're looking for attitudes. We're looking for things that make us feel good as Christians. And there's nothing wrong with wanting to feel good as a Christian, but you can't search for that and that alone. You have to search for Christ. Because he's the only one that can fill the void that's in your heart that you're seeking to fill. So we end up going through these cycles of life where we plant and we move over here. Before this even grows, we move over here and we plant again. And this dies because there's nothing there to water it. Then we go over here. Do y'all follow what I'm saying? Do y'all see the analogy I'm saying? When God, where did God place you in your ministry? You stay there until he tells you to move. You stay there until he, until he tells you to move. Quit hopping from one ministry to another ministry because you're not fulfilling anything but a desire, a need, a feel-good feeling. I promise you, when your feelings are done, when your feelings are gone, and all the extras and all the, the fun, exciting things that we're experiencing right now is gone, the Word of God will stand. The Word of God will never fade away. The only time we ain't never going to have the Bible is when we're in heaven and we're going to have the living Word. We're going to be right there with Jesus. He's going to be everything good. He's going to show us everything, and he will reveal all secrets to every one of us. It's important to have your foundation built on the Word of God. How do you build your foundation on the Word of God? Romans 12, 2 says, Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may show what is that holy and profitable will of God. You be re transformed by the renewing of your mind. You renew your mind by what? Facebook? Come on, millennials, where you at? Instagram? What's the other one? Twitter? Is that how you renew your mind? No. You renew your mind by how? What is the only thing that can change your mind? The Word of God. It's the only thing that can change your mind. You get your mind in the book and you get studied up and you get prayed up because you may be in a good time in your life. That don't mean you stop studying and stop praying. You get this in you so when you don't need it, it's there. All too often we wait to the last minute when our lights kind of dim down a little bit. We're struggling. We're going through some things in life. Then all of a sudden we want to become prayer warriors. All of a sudden we want to start giving when we're in a financial crunch. And we should. But we should already be doing that. You should already be investing in your life and your children by putting the word of God in them. This is the only thing that ain't going to change. This is the only thing that will never change. Right now we've got political parties on both ends, both sides. I get text messages every day, who are you voting for? And I say, not you. And they respond, and I can show you my phone, and they'll respond, well, we're removing you immediately. We're living in a time and a place where everybody wants their truth to be their truth. And it's dangerous. You know why it's dangerous? Because our truths as humans are oftentimes based on our feelings and our emotions. Even though God is an emotional creature, he's an emotional being. And sometimes when things happen to us as Christians, we have emotional outbreaks. I do it all the time. Sometimes I'm just driving down the road and I just start screaming out to Jesus. Just need to get it out. But we can't serve God based off our emotions. Because your emotions are going to fail you. 
your feelings are going to fail you. And at the end of the day, the people that you're trusting and looking towards, who's making you feel good, when they're gone, because they're chasing every wind of doctrine, you're going to be left there stuck and broken and hurt and wondering what just happened. What is your foundation built on? Is it built on the word of God? Or is it built on how somebody's making you feel? Again, I beg you, everything I say from this pulpit, I want you to go and check. Tie it into the Bible. So how are you living as a Christian? How is your Christian walk today? If I looked at you, Miss Roberta, would I be able to tell that the light is in you? Would I, would I be able to tell that Jesus is in you? I know I will. I know. But what about the rest of us? When people see us, how do they see us? How do, they, do we act one way in the church and another way in the world? Being a Christian, what does being a Christian mean? Let's just talk about that for a second. What does being a Christian mean? It means Christ-like, right? So if I'm going to be Christ-like, what did the Apostle Paul said? The Apostle Paul said, imitate me, meaning imitate him. Why? Because he imitates Christ. So sometimes when we get saved and we're new believers and we're trying to find the right way, we may think trying to live like Christ is above and beyond what we could live, so we have to look unto people. Whether we want to accept it or not, people look at us. Are we living in such a way that we are pointing a direct path to Jesus Christ? Am I making sense? Y'all are awfully quiet. What did Pastor Paul used to say? You're awfully quiet in this Presbyterian church. Did he used to say that? Yep. <laughs> How are you living today? And if you stood before Christ and he came right now, would he be happy? Or would he have questions? One thing I tell Daryl all the time that I hope when Christ comes, I hope when that eastern sky parts, I hope when that trump blasts and the dead in Christ rise first in 2 Thessalonians and those who are alive and that we caught up and remain with them in the air forevermore that when he comes that I'm doing his will, that I'm in pounding the pavement, that I'm out reaching lost souls for Jesus Christ, that I'm doing the exact same thing that he called me to do. I know what he called me to do and I just pray, God, give me the strength to do that. Give me the strength to remain faithful and another thing, I'm having a lot of Paulisms this morning. Pastor Paul used to say right now, we're living in, the, in a two-minute warning. How many of you watch football? Not Dallas Cowboys, they don't count. I'm just picking on my family, just picking on my family. I'm just kidding. Hey, how many of you watch football for real, though? The last two minutes, the last two minutes of the game, what do they do? They send in the best. They send in the fastest. They send in the smartest. And they send in the strongest. They send in the people that they know are not going to quit. And they're going to make the play. And they're, we're going to win the game. Right now, church, we're living in a time called the last days. The last days. Signs and wonders are going to follow those who believe. But don't follow those who are performing signs and wonders. We're living in the last days. And God is sending in an army of people for the two-minute warning. Who's not afraid to stand up for truth. And that's us. That's every one of us. He's got a calling, and he's got a place, and he wants you to get in. We can't be bench warmers our whole life. You may have been sitting on the bench. You may have even been the water boy for the first four quarters. But at this two-minute warning, God's raising up people to make a change, to make a stand, because it's going to matter. It may not matter to the people who are around you, but the person that you pray to receive Christ, when he's standing at the judgment seat of Christ, it's going to matter to him. If you live your entire life and only bring one person to a knowledge of Jesus Christ, you've lived a life well lived. Are we living that way this morning? Am I living in such a way that people see Jesus Christ in me? I have this, this bad habit that I call dropping J-bombs. Everywhere I go, I drop a J-bomb. If I'm at Walmart and I'm talking to the cashier, I always say something about Jesus. Just a little J bomb, just to get them talking. Because if they get to talking, then I can get to talking. And if I get to talking about Jesus Christ, then everybody's going to hear about it. So we drop J bombs everywhere. Are y'all dropping J bombs? Huh? Are you dropping J bombs? It's, it's really simple. I, I listen for key words about prayer, 
Or maybe they'll say blessing. Or maybe they'll say things, I always ask them, how you doing? Oh, I'm not doing good. Well, well, can I pray for you? Because I know you're not doing good, and I might be doing a little better than you, and I'm not doing good, but I know Jesus, and I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but I know who holds tomorrow, so can I just pray for you for two seconds? Just two seconds. Because it's not. It's the Holy Spirit that makes these divine appointments. And that comes back to the foundation that you're standing on. You can be on this strong foundation and be secure in who you are as a Christian and not worried about being shaken. Now, don't be embarrassed of the gospel. Stand firm, stand strong, stand tall. Put your chest out with pride. Not pride as in pride comes before a fall, but pride in I'm not ashamed of the gospel and I'm gonna stand up and I'm not gonna give up, back up, or move back until the gospel's been preached to everybody and every ear. Because the Bible says every tongue will confess and every ear will hear that Jesus Christ is Lord. So when you go out in the world, you need to understand that you're in a spiritual battle. You're in a spiritual war. And as you're standing as your lighthouse, these people that are coming, they're unchurched. They don't know nothing about God. They smell sometimes. They're going to be asking you for money every 30 seconds. Can you get me a Big Mac? Can you add cheese? Can you hold the fries? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? These people are coming. But are we ready? Right now we're doing it in men's class. Dwayne's doing an amazing job. If you're not coming to men's class, you're missing out. <laughs> Pastor Dwayne is doing amazing. We're going through Harvest Time uh, International right now, and we're talking about seed time and harvest. And this morning we were talking about the light, and that's why we're talking about it this morning. The light. The light is so powerful. Dead things don't grow without light. Dead things don't grow. But you can take light and put it on something that's been dormant, put it on a seed, and what's gonna happen? It's gonna grow. The point is, get the light in your life. Because you, and you, and you, and all of y'all may be the only Jesus somebody ever sees. So your light that's shining through you by the Holy Spirit will shine onto somebody who's dead in their sins and cause new life to grow. Amen? Can we pray this morning? Can we pray this morning? Father, we just pray right now. Lord, we just lift up our holy hands to you. Lord, we thank you for causing us to be the light into a dark world. We thank you for causing us to be an example to the lost and dying generation, to bring them closer to you, Lord. Lord, I pray as we leave out of here today that we will live our lives in such a way that there will be no question, am I saved? There will be no question when people see us, Lord, not to, to glorify us, Lord, but to glorify you. I would ask you this morning to search your heart. I would ask you this morning to search, your, uh, see what the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about how you're living your life. I know we get in this idea that we have all this time. And I've heard so many people, I'm not ready to give up my life yet. I'm not ready to stop living the way I'm living. And when I'm on my deathbed, I'll ask Jesus to be my savior and go into heaven. But I would ask you this morning, those of you in here and those of you who are watching online, can you tell me when you're gonna die? You may not have an opportunity to ask Jesus to be your savior. The Bible's clear that today is the day of salvation. So with nobody looking around, I would ask you if you have questions in your heart, if you have questions in your mind on whether you're saved or not, just raise your hand. Say, I wanna be saved. I wanna live that life that I hear about. I wanna live that life for Jesus Christ, for, to be my savior. Just raise your hand. Today is the day of salvation. Maybe you're in a place that you are saved. Maybe you got saved at a young age and you just kind of got saved and you just went about your business and never really 
followed after the Lord. Well, I want to reassure you this morning. He's called you. He's sanctified you. He's called you to be separate. He's called you out from among the world. He says before you were born, he knew you. He knows every hair that is on your head. He knows your name. He knew your mama's name. He knew your mama's mama's name. He knows you. Before the foundations of this world was created, he knew you. And I'm going to tell you also that time is running out. I'm not trying to scare you because we're not to walk in fear. But I want you to understand that the amount of time that we think we have, we don't have. Today is the day of salvation. So one more time, online, in service, if you aren't saved and you want to be saved, raise your hand. Don't wait. Don't wait. And maybe you just want to rededicate your life. Maybe you just want to say, I'm ready, Lord. I've been feeling the tug, which I believe God has sent out his spirit, and he's tugging on every single one of us right now to get involved, to dig deeper, to be an example. Because let me tell you something. When I got saved, everything changed. There was a time where nobody in my family even wanted me around. I wasn't even invited to family reunions. But the light of Jesus Christ came into me, and it changed me. Now my entire family, my extended family, and the other states, they don't even make a decision without calling me first. The transformation. I know some of you are saved, but you're not doing the things God's asking you to do. So right now, you don't have to raise your hands, but raise your spirit. You don't have to raise your hands, but I want you to raise your standards to a different place. Raise it to a place that you're going to decide today that I'm no longer going to be the same. I'm no longer going to live the way I've always lived. But today, I'm going to choose to live for Jesus. And that means you're going to have to check off some things. That means you're going to have to sacrifice some things. That means you're going to have to change some things, some attitudes, some heart conditions, people you hang around with. One of the best things that ever happened to me when I got out of prison was quit going around the people that got me there. Because I wasn't strong enough. Now, now that I've been serving Christ and I know what it's like to be broken and hurt and homeless, now I can go back and bring them out. And I know you're sitting here listening to me. And I know God is calling you back into some areas. Not to live that lifestyle, but to reach back in and grab the people. They're sinking right now. They're dying. And they're watching you, whether you think they are or not. So, Father, we just pray right now with every head bowed. We just lift up our standards to you. We lift up our hearts to you. And we say, Lord, moving forward today, we're going to live holy we're going to live righteous. We're going to be set apart, Lord. You have sanctified us, which means you've called us out. You've set us apart to live in such a way to honor you and to glorify you, Father. And because of the decisions we're making this morning, we're going to win our families to Christ. We're going to win our friends to Christ. We're going to win our neighbors. And our cup is going to be full, full of your mercy, full of your grace, full of your goodness. And it's going to be empty of all the hurt and all the pain and all the suffering and all the old ways of life. Because we love you. But even more so, because you loved us. I'm often reminded of one of the scriptures that I believe everybody in the world, Christian and non-Christian, has memorized. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And I'm, I'm reminded, Lord, when I'm studying that my finite mind cannot understand an infinite God, that everlasting is everlasting is everlasting. Lord, when we've been in heaven for 10,000 years, it's just the start, Lord. It will never end. But the other end of that, if we're not in heaven with you, we'll be in hell and eternal damnation. Either way, Lord, we're going to have eternal life. So this day, Lord, here at Light Christian Center, we choose to trust you. We choose to have everlasting life in heaven 
with the King of Kings. And as we go out of here today, strengthen us, strengthen our walk with you, set us apart. In Jesus' name, can we stand and receive the blessing this morning? What a powerful word. He says the two-minute warning. Let us remember that this is the huddle. This is the huddle. So we heard the play. The play has been called to go out and be the light, to be a lighthouse. Will you raise your hands to receive the blessing? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face toward you and give you peace. Today, Father, thank you for the word that came forth, Father. Help us to put it into action, Father. Help us to represent you because you are King of kings and Lord of lords. We love you and we thank you because it's all about you. In Jesus' name I pray. And the church say it. Amen. Amen.